Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the football Grump. With me, as always, is Mike, the Cranky Fan. The Jets beat the Giants 13-10 to in overtime in a rainy, rainy day uh, yesterday. Uh, what's going on, Cranky? You want the Cranky Fan? You're getting it today. So let's just get into this. Um, Go ahead. Talk, man. You know, I've been going to Giant games now. Well, I've been a Giant fan since 1980, since Ray Perkins, since, you know, Scott Brunner was the quarterback. You know, Phil Simms got drafted. Rob Carpenter was their running back. You know, I've been through the ups. I've been through the downs. I moved back up to New York in 1999, so I wasn't able to go to Giant games you know, throughout the glory days of the 80s, you know, even uh, or or the or the the really bad days. I'm not that old to be around for the 70s, and we've had some brutal losses. Uh, you know, a lot come to mind. You know, the uh, the the Deion Sanders punt return, the uh, the uh, the the, uh, the Philly game. This in person is the worst loss in the most embarrassing way that I have personally attended to for a giant game. Um, Grump and I were debating back and forth in the train ride home. Is this the, the worst loss in, in, you know, recent giant history, you know, and we, we both made arguments back and forth between what was the worst, but in person, this is the worst. And, you know, I can accept that the giants are injury riddled. I can accept that we had to go down to a third string quarterback who has no business being on an NFL field. What I cannot accept is this defense, this coaching staff, this special teams unit, that when it is fourth and goal deep in New Jersey, in the Jets territory with 20 something seconds left with a three point lead, you are losing the game. And I know it was a combination of 100 things that went wrong. The bottom line is that is thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly unacceptable, embarrassing, and disgraceful. I'm not calling for anybody's heads. That's overreaction, and that's a little silly. But Jesus Christ, we suffered for three hours in the freezing rain, in a shitty stadium that these two teams playing both paid for that, you know, he almost died in a fire hazard trying to get to the bathroom with no roof. And you're playing a team with, you know, possibly could be the worst quarterback in the league you're playing against who can do nothing on offense and somehow snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And I am just, this may be just a venting session for me this episode. There may be some incoherence. I might even be logical for it, but I don't know. I, I just, I, I can't, I can't accept what happened at the end of this game. And it makes everything that was positive to me almost moot. We're going to talk about stars and farts. You lose a game like that, I don't give stars. I will acknowledge you've played well when we get into those, talk about offense, defense, special teams. but. That's a collective fail. That's an embarrassment. And this team has to look themselves in the mirror because we have a lot of games left this season. And this thing can go really south really quickly. So, soapbox off. I think you know where I feel. I, um, I, it's very simple for me. I, I know you want to, you, you listed the coaches, the special teams, and the defense that you will not accept what happened. I have, I, I have a completely different take. I have that despite everything, going into this game, they had, I mean, going into this game with what they have, it's remarkable that they're even competitive. Um, and despite that, and despite losing the quarterback and having to get a guy who had split scout team reps, we'll get into that later, um, to run more than half of this game, I think... That despite that, the entire coaching staff and 52 players did enough to
to win this game 16-10. to One guy missed two field goals. And I know you're going to say that the defense, blah, 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 blah. doesn't matter. You hit those two field goals, the Jets aren't scoring a touchdown. They not, didn't. <laughs> exactly. They did. It's not like Zach Wilson marched down the field and put together a game-winning drive. He had two plays. That was it. It was two pass plays that was close enough for a field goal. Does that technically? I mean, yes, but I mean, they, they were not going down the field and scoring a touchdown if Graham Gano hits that field goal. Also, Graham Gano missed an earlier field goal. So, I mean, this this really should have been over 16 to, to 10. Um, sorry, sorry, 16 to 7, right? 16 to 7, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, they wouldn't even... Actually, if he had hit both field goals and it were 16 to 7, there's not even a reason... The game is not theoretically... It's mathematically over. With 20 seconds and a kickoff, the Jets aren't scoring two times. With no timeouts. So... So, hang on. I You're not wrong in saying that the defense is to blame for a little bit and, and, and to blame and, and this person's to blame. At the end of the day, despite everything, they still should have won. One guy screwed up twice. And all he had to do was screw up one time. He had a one screw up mulligan for this game. They probably still would have won 13-7. Uh, to 7. So, yes, it's inexcusable that you let Zach Wilson complete two passes. Um, but we're, and, not, we're on overtime still. Overtime, he had two pass interference calls. One no, on that, way, that's, a let, that's a letdown by your defense. Overtime shouldn't have even happened. But it did. Okay, fine, but it doesn't matter. My point is they had no business being competitive in this game, and I'm not going to erase eight tackles for a loss, seven passes defended, nine QB hits, four sacks. Yeah, I'm not. Please. I'm not. I am not going to say. I am not going to say that it's the defense's fault that they lost this game. It but, isn't. It isn't. It's the kicker's fault. It's the kicker's fault. The defense, it is the defense's pride and joy that the Jets really should have only had seven points in this game. Against Zach Wilson and probably the I second worst second I don't care. I don't care. This is the same team that beat Philly. It's a better team than beat Philly. So I don't care. That does not matter to me. No, you probably, can keep you yeah. can keep saying it, but what what is what is Philly's excuse? Are I mean, you? I'm not, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the public defender of Philly. It doesn't matter. You have to put two on the table. If, if you're going to lambast the defense specifically for giving up what amounts to four plays, two of which happened in a quarter that should have never happened because of somebody else, because of somebody else, I'm not. I'm not putting this on the defense at all. I'm not. And and if I'm going to put it on them at all, it's going to be that in the final drive of regulation, they were in prevent formation that allowed the first completion the first well, completion to happen. Well, that's why that's why I put it on the coaches as well. I mean, this is a, I, a collective fail. Yeah, it's a collective but I mean, all right, so we're we're going to go into that we've had our our different takes on the end of the game. Well, let's talk really quickly right before we get into offense defense. Let's talk about what actually happened. Let's just clear the air with everybody else that Everybody watched the game. The decision the decision to kick the field goal versus the going for it that's irrelevant. Well, no, hang on, hang on. No, th- that's irrelevant? Whether they kicked or not, did the outcome it shouldn't have mattered either way. The fact is you still should never yeah. give it. You, you, you mm, yeah, yeah, because you still would. Let's say you went for it on fourth down. You didn't get it. There's still a ball. All right, seven yards, you know, further back. You make it game over. Obviously, you kick the field goal. Pretty much game over as well. So really, the odds of winning. I don't know. I don't buy whatever ESPN's projection number is. That's a made up horseshit number. That's I don't a, care about that's, that. That's just math. That's just I a formula. Yeah, I don't care about that. It's, but the fact, the bottom line is. Either way, you can make an argument for either one. I don't I don't blame the coaching staff at all for doing what they did, unless they know that Graham Gano clearly couldn't kick. Well, I'm going to say there's a collection of coaching decisions that led up to this game, some of which happened before Sunday. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. there's a collection of coaching decisions that I think played into this loss. And I say that with the asterisk that despite everything, one guy missed a field goal. Like, all the mistakes that we're going to talk about, 
here with the offense playing like shit. We're going to talk about that with coaching decisions. We're about to talk about that other special teams problems. We're going to talk about all that stuff, but had one guy made his field goal, made one of the two that he missed it, everything that we're about to talk about wouldn't even matter. So, I mean, to me, that is the, the crux of this is that Graham Gano missed what is essentially an extra point. I do think that the fourth down decision does play into it because it was a story that Graham came into this game hurt. It's his non-kicking leg, but it's still a story. The weather conditions were absolutely dreadful. He had already missed earlier in the game, and it was fourth and one, and you could say at that point, Saquon Barkley was... That was the point in the game in which I think the Jets' defense felt pretty defeated because we had marched down the field. We didn't get the ball, like, on the 20. You know what I mean? It's like... No, we, we did. We... We had just previously marched down the field with Saquon Barkley being the right. entire offense. Correct. Um, I think you could make the argument that you could get one yard there. I think at that point, the Jets were a little bit dejected. I think they felt like the game was over. Um, and I think that you could have just run a normal power running play and you'd have gotten the first down. At that point, you just kneel. That game is literally over yeah. at that point. So I, I mean, but I don't. I'm not going to slaughter the coaching staff for choosing to kick it because I still think that I don't. I don't know that it's the right decision, but it's not the wrong decision to kick. And there's certainly over. you know what I mean. There's not a greater risk from one or the other either, because again, the odds of hap- what happened after were so so low. Agreed. I, I agree I'm with not, that. I'm not going to kill either way because I my for initial thought was kick because to me. If they kick and they make it, okay, they, they start going to get a touchdown. You know, I, 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 so, but the risk of it was like, okay, if we don't make it. You still have to march down the field and kick They the still field. have to march down all the way down with the no field. With no time. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree so with you. I, I, it, I'm not going to – that to me is almost basically a coin flip what to do. But you're right. With the other factors that Graham Gano is not right. Right. That maybe you should have, but I'm not going to kill the decision. I'm not going to, like I said, I don't think it's the wrong decision, but I don't think it was the best decision at that moment, everything considered. But I certainly don't think it's the wrong decision. I'd never rip mm-hmm. anyone apart. And I, I saw this thing floating around today, the sentiment, or I guess it was yesterday, was um, how stark the difference is between what Brian Dable would do, like using the the going for two against Tennessee in week one last year as an example of you know, the, the gambling aspect versus, you know, at this point, I mean, this, I don't even need to finish the sentence. You have a backup quarterback in there. Then you have the backups backup in there. You yeah. are not even throwing passes there. This, there is a to point. It also wasn't a play to win the game either. It was it's just not even, a, that yeah. I, I'm not saying that play. Yeah. I mean, the general philosophy the last couple of weeks, like what's happened. I mean, you've said this before. Coaches are going to coach for their jobs. And in week one of his debut year, a year in which he's getting a whole pass because, you know, it, it, he's inheriting a roster. The draft was fucking weird. Like, everything was yeah. weird. He he had the leash to just do And if they lost, they lost. I mean, they could say, you know, if only I'd called this player. If only he broke this tackle, then we would have won that game. And, and no one – everyone goes, ah, good try. I mean, the difference is now the wrong coaching decision. You lose the game. You don't have the same leash you had in year one. It's year two. Now, it doesn't mean he has no leash. It just means that coaches are going to be more conservative when they don't trust what they have on the field. And I mean, the amount of trust he had in Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley in week one last year was probably the most trust he had in any two players on the team. Um Every decision that's made by a coach is a calculus. What is the gives me the best chance right. to succeed? So and, I mean, I, I, I yeah, yeah I, I think that there were other coaching decisions that I think might have been worse than that. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Um, for starters, and and this is sort of news, so we should talk about this. Daniel Jones was cleared for contact Sunday at eleven thirty a.m. The story goes is that uh, that's when he was scheduled to see the doctors again. So it was not calculated decision it was not a game time decision that was just his next checkup appointment per third party doctors uh he was already declared out on friday so he could not be activated even though he was cleared for contact and even if he was he'd only taken scout team reps in practice the week before now here's here's my problem there is there's a lot of weirdness here with what the coaches did with daniel jones injury and i'm not saying that they made massive mistake and that the answer was obvious but Last week, and Bobby Skinner's been on a 
tear about this all day, but it's it's certainly weird. Last week he was ruled questionable, and so therefore he could have been activated on game day if needed. Um, as far as I know, there is no reason to declare him out on Friday. The reason you declare him out on Friday is because he didn't take any practice reps. Not really. Just scout team reps. Fine. I understand that. Here's my problem. If Daniel Jones can only take scout team reps, then you are taking reps away from Tommy DeVito, who is the backup. Whether he belongs on an NFL field is irrelevant. You're right. He doesn't right now, belong on an NFL right field. Right now he is. He but is. you know why he deserves to be on an NFL field? Because that's his roster spot. He's the backup. He has a game day jersey means you deserve to be there because you don't have any other choice. So right. now you have a quarterback who you, – sorry. You have a second-half offense that is one pass to 24 runs and then in overtime was three straight screen passes. I mean that – this was a – you had a backup that was not prepared to be a backup. And that's especially egregious given that Tyrod Taylor can't even fall on the ball without getting hurt. Mm -hmm. So, again, I say this. This was, in my opinion, a bad weekly coaching decision. Was banking on Daniel Jones doing anything against the Jets. I think that once it's Tuesday, you need to stop this nonsense. Mm -hmm. with holding out hope for DJ to play on a short week. I don't even want him to play on a short week. I'm happy he was cleared on a Sunday before the game so that he could be mentally ready Monday to be mentally ready to yeah. go Tuesday. I mean, you know are, we, I mean? like, are, we, are we playing 4D chess to try to beat the no, Jets? No, I think we're being stupid. I think <laughs> we're holding out hope... I think I think we I think we made a bad decision. I think we're just trying to do well. I don't I think we understand that Tommy DeVito shouldn't be playing and the less we have to worry about him the better. But all we did was put Tommy DeVito in the worst possible situation. Um I I think yeah. that's a pretty huge coaching move there that that was a screw up. And and we've made personnel screw ups before. I mean I, I don't know, man. Uh, and again, yeah. that mistake, one guy missed a field goal. Still could have won. With with a second-half offense of one pass and 24 rushes. Yeah, I mean, and we, a touchdown. And we, a we, touchdown we were, in the second half. We were looking up stats. You know, at the, so I was looking them up like fourth quarter, late fourth quarter. There had only been one team in NFL history that had won a game with negative passing yards. And Two. I was all ready was, to, you know. The, uh, so, sorry, you're right. There were three. There was one negative. Two was zero. Correct, correct. And we, and we would have had the most negative yards. Right. Because negative was, three was the record, right? I was going to feed that to you to post as soon as the game was over. And it was and just it. now, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, the decision even that Tommy DeVito is the third string quarterback is something you can even question. Because, you know, even if that guy had every single rep this this week, that guy is not an NFL quarterback. I mean, remember last year or two years can ago. I, can I dispute that? Go ahead. Tyson Badgett, Chicago Bears. And? He looks like a quarterback out there. He throws the ball. He runs the offense. Went in there for Justin Fields and looked normal. Why Why is he so different than Tommy DeVito? Do you even know where Tyson Badgett went to school? Yeah, he went to some... He's like the all-time passing leader he everywhere. He shepherd. Yeah, but he's also like the all-time most prolific passer in Division Three. And I know that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. But I was going to say, listen, man, I, I saw him at the <laughs> Senior Bowl. I saw he had the tools. He could make all the throws. But he was the slowest processor. I thought that he had like a two-year projection of being possibly like some some like sleeper but, guy that came in and relieved Justin Fields and did something but, crazy. But let me ask you. So let, let's just – my, my point is, is that the Chicago Bears were able to run a – NFL recognizable offense and win a game with Tyson Badgen, who ha has just as much right to be on the field as Tommy DeVito, and probably a worse team, right? Chicago worse, worse weapons on offense. Pretty much, yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty so, bad. So I, I mean, they could have had him ready to win a game or like run an offense. They could have had him more, they could have had him more ready to at least try to run the offense functionally. Winning is a whole other thing, but right, right. at least but, but, not be to not run, be solely one dimensional. He he could have yes. run the game plan is what I mean. Like he could have run This is not Daniel Jones didn't get injured last week. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. 
knowing Daniel Jones, knowing that it's a neck injury, it's a, it's not the same injury, but it's a similar injury to the one that he had that knocked him out of a whole season, knowing that you have Tyrod Taylor who can't stay healthy, they should have had Tommy DeVito functional enough to run an offense in which he is a threat of a passer. That's all I'm saying. Yep, I agree. Well, okay, I'm, okay. I'm not, sorry. Just, but my my I might as well make a bigger point about uh, you know Tommy DeVito is – is this what is the what is the ceiling of Tommy DeVito on this team? Period. Is it to eventually be a functional backup? I mean, it's yeah. not going to be a starter. I mean, what- yeah, no, I, th- I think I th- what I what I had said about him is that like after three years, he could be a very functional backup. I think I was encouraged by the preseason to delude myself into saying if they work on him really hard this year, he could just replace Tyrod next year. When Tyrod's no longer under contract, rather than going out and buying a backup. And I think I even said, like, maybe you go out there and you buy a Matt Barkley, like a cheap veteran presence, a Davis Webb type, you know, somebody like that. But but Tommy DeVito is the guy you're really grooming to be the really cheap backup quarterback. And I thought, you know, we, we had done that in the past with Eli Manning. And I'm not saying Daniel Jones is Eli Manning, but they had the similar role in being the entrenched starter. This is not a QB competition. Then you bring in young guys. They're not competition. They're backups. You know what I mean? I, I saw that as him not next year, 2025. Seems like a long time to develop somebody just to be a backup quarterback. No, I don't <laughs> think so. No, I don't. I, that's that's pretty typical. Two years? I mean, yeah, I, I mean... You, two years on the practice squad. I didn't think he would need to be elevated off the practice squad. That's yeah, not I mean, uncommon. It seems. It just seems to me like a long time. Just for, for a position of, well, you're we're grooming you to be the backup, where I feel like you can get kind of anybody to do that. For you, not much I more do money. not... You can get... It, de- it depends. Yes. Mm. You'll always get cheaper when it's a drafted guy or an undrafted free agent in this case. You'll always be cheaper that way. Um... But that's 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 your hope is that you know you keep on the practice squad you pay him nothing you pay him a, like a hundred grand or something to stick around the practice squad and you hope that he takes on a role where you don't have to pay three million dollars you know mm-hmm. what I mean uh, it, in the grand scheme of things three million dollars against the cap isn't that much but three million versus the vet minimum is a big deal. Here's the bottom line though with any NFL team there is when you are down to your third string quarterback no matter it is you are going to struggle mightily. And it doesn't matter who that third string guy is. It's unfortunate that our third string guy is at the bottom of the developmental schedule than maybe some other teams. But when you are down to the third string guy, you can expect to have a, an offense that's going to be this troubled. <laughs> really? Do you, do you agree with me with this? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 We're but, picking nits a little bit. About I, but I don't think I am. Like, like I said, like y- yes, you get down to your third string quarterback, you are already in. You know, to use the ESPN percentage projection to win, you are now sub twenty five percent to me. Once you've gone down to your third string quarterback, especially with the offensive line that you're dealing with, and is that the, what they say it is? Is that ESPN? They, they no, I, I, I'm just. Oh, I was gonna say it seems a lot lower than that. No, <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I put, I yeah. just threw that number out there in yeah. the open, mm-hmm. but. Uh, that being said, not being able to even be the threat of a pass is an indictment on the coaching staff. Not having a who is, for better or worse, the backup quarterback mm-hmm. in that situation. 100% they, they did not have him ready to even pretend to be a quarterback, which is on them. And it's because he was splitting reps with a guy who has a neck problem and wasn't cleared for contact even by midweek. So... To and me, never, that, that's never just really a... thought it was going to play anyway. It was really no chance of him playing, so why are you wasting everybody's time? It's so silly because I'm not saying Brian Dable specifically, but coaches bitch and moan about the new CBA and how limited practice time is and how few reps there are, and this is an egregious waste of reps in my opinion. Now, again, to, to agree with you, not calling for anybody's heads, you know, not anything, but coaching for me in this game, they both coached a game plan that could win the game and – did it the dumbest way possible. So I, I don't even know. It's like a push for me, whether it's a star or a fart. It's an honorable mention for both because they did manage to coach against one of the best defenses in the league, a pathway that should have won despite all of their fuck-ups and, and all the, we, the player screw-ups. Let's uh, back up a bit. Yeah, yeah. When uh, Tyrod Taylor left the game, yes, we were still at 
negative yards passing. We, I mean, we ended with negative yards passing. I know, but I'm saying, though, it's, it's not like, you know, for the majority of the game, Tommy DeVito was in there and we were just having to, like, doggy paddle away from keeping from drowning. No, Tyler Tommy... played, played a lot of this game, too, and we had zero passing game. Yes. Zero. Zero. Nothing. Zero. Yep. That goes on that goes on coaching as much as poor execution too. Yeah, yeah. And and again, I, I wanna this the theme of this, because we have two bad offensive lines and two bad quarterbacks, the theme is, is that this was the ugliest game ever. When in reality this is I mean that to me, that's not there's truth to that, but this is a lot of what was a pitching duel. I mean, this is two really, really good defenses playing two bad offenses. So yeah. it's not it's not like this isn't the New York Yankees playing the the Mud Hens. You know what I mean? This is closer to the Mets playing the Mets. And this, this is... wasn't even the 87 strike scab team of the Giants playing the scab Redskins. Because you're right, there was such a, you know, two great defenses. Those were not scab defenses. Those were real defenses. Yeah, I mean, I mean that you... were, you know, playing, playing scout teams. The, the, yeah, I mean... The... You have the extra hurdle in that this is a bad offense. To me, this is like two years ago, the Mets bats trying to face DeGrom. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. yes, there are no bats. We don't need to argue about that. But also, it's DeGrom. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. So, to me, that's what was happening on both sides of the field. This was the Mets bats against DeGrom at the same time. Um, So, yes, you're right. Um, Yeah, you're right. And, and this was an ugly game, but also, if you like defense, there was a lot of really, really good defense in this game. Yes, there were some shitty passes by Zach Wilson that were like three yards behind guys, but also we saw Cordell Flott get an arm in there really, really late. Deontay Banks, you know, despite being picked on by Garrett Wilson, who's one of the better wide receivers in the league, I I, I can I think you can say one of the best wide receivers in the league. Oh, definitely. Um, He played a great game. The, the, he didn't the, get loose hardly at all, Garrett Wilson. No, I mean... In fact, some of the catches he had, Deontay Banks was in great coverage. It was just insanity by a very good wide receiver. So there was a lot of good to be seen in this game, too. I mean, we don't even have to talk about the defensive line. I mentioned the stats. Kayvon Thibodeau, you know, in perfect script with the scripted radio argument to hype him up for this game, answered the call against, you know, one of the worst offensive lines in the league. But... I mean, you know, he, he didn't just stuff come up play. big. He came up big in the biggest moments. I Absolutely. mean, he is the one who got the fourth down sack on Zach Wilson that allowed that missed field goal by Graham Gano. I know Zach Wilson's bad, but you have to capitalize on bad quarterback play. Zach Wilson likes to drift backwards like 15 yards every time a play breaks down rather than navigate the pocket. Mm-hmm. He likes to backtrack. And Kayvon made him pay. I mean, they, these were like 15, 20-yard sacks. They were crazy. Um, he looked like a dominating player. He looked he, like a do- he looked like the best player on the field and looked like a dominating player. I, I would and say that he looked he looked like the second best. I think Dexter Lawrence looked like the best player on the field. Dexter Lawrence looked like first of all he was getting held on every single play. Um, and which, we're not. Which we both noticed. We both said how many times? Four times we said to each other during yeah. the game. There's a hold. There's yep. a hold. There's a hold. It was every time, really, he split the the double team and then Zach Wilson broke the pocket. He was getting held by one or Mm -hmm. two offensive linemen. But I'm not going to complain about officials in this game because I actually think not calling holdings was like offensive line holdings actually helped move this game along. I think they were lenient with O-line holding because, I mean, honestly, we had 24 punts in this game. You made a joke after two punts, I think on back-to-back garbage drives from Giants and then Jets. Or vice versa, Jets yeah. and Giants. You made the joke. It's like, do you think we're going to hit 11 punts? It's like, we might hit 11 punts in the first half. And we did. Guess what? We did. Yeah. yeah. What's the over-under in this? Uh, you're taking over on 11? Yeah. And you're like, yep. Yeah. So we hit we hit more than 11 in the first half. I, I do think that calling offensive holdings to the letter would have been brutal. It would have made this game on. I, I would have left. It was, it was 2.05 and the first quarter just ended. 2.05. And... I don't know about you, but I was not enjoying sitting in those weather conditions. And that game, it felt like it was an hour. It felt like it was two and a half hours at that point. It, so that, that yeah. was so you were saying, and it was fair. It was consistent. It wasn't like they were yeah. calling up, holding on us and not on them. It was. I agree. You know, if, if you're going to call it, just all I ask for in the, in the official is just be consistent. Yeah, be just yeah, be fair. 
So mm-hmm. I, I think it was fine that they weren't calling holdings the whole game. There were some other calls I think were weird, dubious, bullshit, but nothing out of the ordinary for officials, so I'm not going to bitch. Um, this was... All right, so let's let's stick with the defense then. Um, sure. I think, after watching this game, I feel very good. I feel very good about this linebacker group with mm-hmm. Okereke McFadden. I feel mm-hmm. incredible about this defensive line. It sucks Leonard William is gone, but I think that we're still really, really good on the defensive line, and I think that they're gonna, they were going to replace him anyway with a young guy or a different guy next year. So it is what it is. Um, sucks that it's a captain, though. Isn't it weird? Mm. Um, you, you make a deal, you make a deal, you know. I feel you, great you, about you, Deontay you Banks. Are, you are disrupting the locker room when you trade somebody anyway whether it's a captain or not especially a guy that's a a veteran a respected guy who's been through the league been through the wars and is very a a positive impact on the field and off so it whether the c is on his uniform or not you're going to disrupt this locker room and you know this locker room that's one of the big challenges this coaching staff's gonna have to do is this locker room can go in the free fall very very quickly i do feel good about both deontay banks and Jason Pinnock, I think, had a great game. Um, he did not have the easiest assignment. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we mentioned Cordell Flott. I'm, I'm waiting for the day in which Cordell Flott just gets a legitimate shot on the outside. I don't know. The two guys well, that I, you know, I think we, we might find out in a couple of days with the deadline coming up. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. The two guys that I think had a, a rough game were Dory Jackson, who is hurt, and that is what it is. But he's not a fit for the slot. And. Mm-hmm. I think that it shows uh, he was busted for the the DPI at the end of overtime that allowed yep. for the, the – but, but again, also underthrown ball, but he did get beat. Um, he also, I believe, was in coverage on the broken play that allowed the end of regulation field goal spot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've had that, a lot of examples throughout the season, though, too. We've we grumbled about I, this. I, I don't think that a door – yeah, I, some of that – early in the season, I think you can attribute some of that to Adore Jackson's not a fit for the slot. He's just the best corner we have, so he makes the most sense there when we have no slot corner. Fine. Uh, the broken play is a broken play. That's Sandlot football. So he just allowed that to happen. I'm sorry. Um, Adore Jackson is another one that I think is in the exact same boat as Leonard Williams. I don't think I'm being uh, – that, that's not a hot take. I mean – Contract negotiation-wise, you know, he's another one that's going to command a lot of money. He's in the last year of a deal. Uh, he's His a big, heir parents are there. And, and, and Exactly. And now you feel good. I think you feel good about Trey Hawkins, Cordell Flott, and Deontay Banks, where you can and, say, you know what, this this year's a wash. We can actually get something for a Dory Jackson. Let's get something for a Dory Jackson. And also, let's let that trio play without the without the pressure of we got to win this game this week. We got to win this game, you know, next week. It's the rest of this season. Let's make the rest of this season as uh, productive as we can for the overall growth of this team going forward. So now, you know, if it's like, well, we need to beat Vegas this week to keep in, you know, up with Dallas for a wild card. The playoffs are not happening, guys. So let them play. Let them get the experience. Let them take their lumps. You know, it's it's going to pay play pay in spades next year. You know, when we start all over again. Another guy I think didn't play the greatest game and hasn't played really great all year. I've given him a star before, but um, Xavier McKinney. Same same negotiation boat. This is the last year of his contract. The Giants need to make a decision on him. Um, gun to your head. Right now, today, let's pretend it's the deadline or he walks. Are you extending Xavier McKinney? No. I don't think – I don't – his play is – first of all, the money he's going to want for the level of consistency that he gives us in the time frame we need, none of that matches up. I think he goes. I, I think that he is a good player that can be a part of a core. I think that most teams would want a player like Xavier McKinney. I also think that he is not going to command the money that he thinks he's going to command. I do think that while he probably is a good leader in the locker room and leader in the huddle, I think that there is a little bit of an attitude problem. A little bit. Um, 
I, I don't know. It's a sense I get from him. It's that's all. You know, saying things like we're not going to keep blaming the defense for losses like a couple weeks back. It's just it's just not a very captain answer to the media. And I could see that personality in the future potentially outpouring into worse situations. On its face, I don't have a problem with him saying it, but just you know. When you're when you're talking about the future and giving a guy a second deal and all that other stuff, you should be on your best behavior for your rookie contract. Just saying, like, yep. especially especially if you're like a penciled in captain and all that stuff, you should be on your best behavior. You got the ATV accident, you know. He he had some tackling captain issues. Captain means something. Captain has responsibility. Captain means you're at a higher standard than the other people. Exactly. Yeah. So, I I think I agree with you. I think the other thing to consider though is how long you can hang out i think if you are able to get wink martindale to stay whatever that means if it's like you know he's gonna take a head coaching job if he earns one if he interviews one and is offered one or whatever but if it comes down to like look man just take this extra money and stay here another year you'll get another head coaching opportunity get a guy that fits wink you know wink had to fit xavier mckinney around him and i'm not saying that xavier mckinney can't play it or whatever but let him pick his guy. I mean, we see what happens. He picked a guy in the fifth round just based on traits, and he like earned starter reps with Trey Hawkins. You know what I mean? So, oh, I think I think that if Wink Martindale is staying, it is another bullet in the gun that shoots McKinney off of this team. How old is Wink? I don't know. I mean, he's not young, right? He's not young, but he's not Tom Coughlin. He's not Coughlin. I kind of got the hunch. The more I think about him, I think he is a lifer coordinator. Like a guy like Kafka, you know, he's going to get a head coaching job. Uh, maybe, you know, the rapid ascent might slow down a year, maybe because of what happened this year. But I just kept that gut feeling more and more that Wink is going to be is a lifer of a coordinator. Maybe I'm wrong, but you know, I don't. I don't I, think that you're wrong, but I think that. I do think that there is something to him being good with the media. Tells me that he's probably good in an interview room. I think he's a smart guy. Like, so like, you have Rex Ryan, right? He's good with the media. He's probably good in an interview. Mm -hmm. Not really that smart of a guy. Goes into offensive meetings, screws everything up, changes the back, the blackboard to be upside down for the offensive players. All kinds of crazy shit. Yeah, you can read a whole book about all the dumb things that Rex Ryan did while being a head coach. But right. Rex Ryan, not a very intelligent guy, but great. And and even he was still able to get to two AFC championships and then continue to get jobs after that. I think Wink Martindale is probably smarter on a football basis, um, and that works in his favor. You know, I also think that the current trend of X quarterbacks that went to some crazy smart school becoming quarterback coaches and then immediately becoming yeah and then immediately becoming offensive coordinators and then after two years becoming an nfl head coach is just that i think that is a trend i right now do you see mike kafka on the hot would you hire mike kafka to be a head coach based on anything you've seen uh well sir obviously not this year uh but, I mean, last year you can only attribute a certain percentage of the offense to him and the other percentage to Brian Dable, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for I, sure. I, I do think that that's a trend, and I think that mm -hmm. the NFL is a trendy organization oh, in which gosh. owners a, and GMs yeah. only know trends, and they try to do the same thing that everybody else is doing for success. And I think that at a certain point that fizzles out, and you go back to your regular rotation of interviews, and I think a guy like Wink commands – Attention. That's let me, all. Let me, let me, I don't. My, I don't disagree with you. I, I do think that probably win, he is, but because you said something about that he's a, a smart guy, I don't see him just jumping at the first coaching job that comes. Like I don't see him going to a place like Arizona if that becomes available, or you know another another mess of a team. I think it's a it's a be like the apps like if. For some reason, Hop Harbaugh had to leave and leave Baltimore or something. I could see something like that, like a at least a team with potential to be great. I don't think him, I don't see him at a, you know, a rebuilding type of team. So I think the number of positions that would be, you know, optimal for him or appealing to him, I think is kind of low. I agree with that because I think, again, because he's not a young pup, that he's going to have one shot. 
to be a head coach in this league. And he's not going to waste it. He's not going to do the Bill Belichick of, all right, I'm going to do, you know, you know, Cleveland and, you know, and New England or whatever. And then, okay, then the New England thing. I think he's going to get one opportunity. Um, defensive line was insanely dominant. Uh, we already kind of talked about that. I don't really have anything else to add was, to the defense. I, I think it was just a combination of them playing really well and playing against a, a yep. really, really bad defense offensive line and a really, really bad quarterback. But, you know, something you can't, you can't take away the fact that they did their job and did it well. Yeah, so. it, it, that's my thing. Like, I'm going to award stars to Dexter Lawrence and I'm going to award stars to Deontay Banks and Kayvon Thibodeau because, yes, you're right. They should have eaten in this game. And they mm-hmm. did. They did what they were supposed to, as oh. expected. I, I think even if I wrote down these stats, I would have looked at them and be like, they're not going to get that, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm not going to, I'm not awarding stars today. And that's a moral thing with me, but that's I'm going to give an honorable mention, I think, to Kayvon Thibodeau because, again, I felt like he was. Not only completely dominant, but also I think everything is time and place. Right. I mean, he was the story this week. Unfortunately, he became a story. And how did he respond to that? He responded like Jefferson did in Fast Times at Ridgemont High when they they smashed his car. He was a complete animal and just destroying everything. And that's what you want if you want to have an elite athlete on your team somebody who steps up in the biggest of occasions whether it's you're playing a rival you're playing in the playoffs you're playing when you know the spotlight is on you you playing when there's adversity and for him to do that is a massive growth i don't care who he was playing with i don't care if he was playing against you know five tackling dummies the fact is he did it he did his job he was dominant he was a game changer and that is not all development and not all results are linear. It doesn't go like this. Like all of a sudden, you don't start off great or all of a sudden it's a line. Sometimes you have to do this. And this was a huge step for him. We talked about the offense a little bit. Um, there's not much to say other than Saquon probably did as good as you could ask of him, being that he is still playing with a high ankle sprain, I think. Can I, um, yeah, go ahead. I, want, I want to ask you, let's just talk about the offensive line for a minute. And let's try to... Let's try to parse out everything else. Let's parse out who the quarterback was behind them. And even let's parse a little bit out who they were playing against. I don't feel like the offensive line was as much of a sieve as the Jets' offensive line was. I think they kind of did as good as I think they could be. And I don't think it was awful, awful, awful. No, I, I think it was, it's, it's so hard to say. I know, uh, I know. And I'm trying it, here, to like, Here's why it's hard to say, right? We got more pressures. They got more tackles for loss because we ran the ball more and they passed the ball more. So I, I think it maybe I don't know. I, theirs looks worse. Ours looks like a bad offense. Like when you can't run the ball, that always just the eye test. If you're if you're ca- even you and me, people who know what we're looking at, whatever. If you're just eating chips and you know you're talking to me and you're playing on your phone and you look up at the screen every once in a while, right? And you see that it mm-hmm. looks like bad offense. It doesn't yeah. look like great defense really. But when you see every time a quarterback goes back to drop up and you see defenders chasing him around, that looks like crazy good defense just mm-hmm. casually. Yep. At the end of the day, it was probably the same for both. Bad offensive line, worse quarterback, and really good defensive lines. And, and really the- good defensive coordinators for that matter. Yeah, and here's my kind of support for what I said was the fact that with zero passing game, you are focusing. I said to you a couple of times, I'm like, look, there's 11 guys on the line. There's yeah, 10 right. guys on the line. And the fact that Saquon could do anything. Yeah, that's fair. And not just, well, that's Saquon being Saquon. I mean, it was actually, you know, it was – Again, not. It was not a talking. lot less Saquon being Saquon. I mean, like we we said, like the one where there were a couple plays where he was being him. Like I saw mm-hmm. him hop out of a tackle. I saw sure. him do a couple spin moves. But the big plays, he just hit a hole, and he didn't have that extra gear that he normally has because he's hurt. And well, he got right caught. There. You, all you said was he hit a hole. Yeah, but yeah. Him, you know, if this is a you know a, a, as bad as this offensive line has been, and also expecting the run every play, there is no. He hit the hole. It's he ran to a brick wall. So I mean, again, this is not, you know, this is not the hogs. This is not the greatest offensive line of all time. But it's not as wretched 
as it has been and could have been as well. Last thing on the offense, I think. Because there was no passing game. There's really no point to talk about the receivers at all. I, well, I have nothing to other say. Other than Waller getting hurt, I guess. Yeah, yeah and, and I don't really have any update on that. We'll talk about Tyrod a little bit. But um, okay. um, my, my, my question to you is, if you had to choose between playing the Jets' defense and the Cowboys' defense, what would you choose? Uh, healthy or right now? Uh, you mean the Giants being healthy or correct? Correct. Let's say yes, Giants being healthy. Who would you rather play? Hmm. It's hard, right? It's, it's very hard. hard. Okay, it's all right. Very hard so the, I, well, yeah, hang on, I, hang on. The the point is, is that you it's it's a difficult decision, but we agree that Week One looked a lot worse, and it. It's because we were running like a real offense. We yeah. were trying to – my question to you is, let's just say they felt so not confident week one that they were like, I know we feel good about ourselves, but this is Dallas. We need to run a very specific heavy run game plan against this defense. Do you think it looks better if they went in with Daniel Jones and a healthy uh, Giants team running essentially the same game plan that they ran against the Jets? I mean, clearly it looked better. With Tyrod oh, Taylor and and Tommy absolutely. DeVito, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's why there is no debate about it, the Jones versus Taylor argument. I mean that that is a a legitimate starting quarterback running an offense. So yeah, I I, I think um, you know, obviously there's a bit of a passing game. Yeah, I, I think that the giant the Cowboy defense scares you because just their ability to get at the quarterback in passing situations seems a lot worse and and it's flashier too, and um. I think I probably would rather play the Jets one because I I just don't know if you're going to accumulate as many sacks and as many big negative plays on to put you in, you know, second and 23 as much as Dallas potentially could. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I was just making a point. Like, I, I think that uh, had we tried to run our traditional offense, it would have looked absolutely dreadful. Uh, but they, they did, to the coach's credit, because I've been hard on them, like they did put together a game plan that, would have won them the game had a kicker done his job, his only job. I think if I think if you know Tyrod Taylor doesn't get hurt, I think this game we win this game going away at the end. So I think. Hang on, I want to transition that to Tyrod Taylor because okay. this was a game in which you could make the argument that he did the one thing that makes you the most furious. But when you look at it, he didn't even do anything all that crazy. I, I mean. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I mean, the, the play in which he got hurt is the play in which he got hurt. And and I think throughout the whole game, there was only one hit he took where he decided to scramble, which was, I think, a QB design run. Um, there was only one play in which it was like, what are you, why are you doing that? This one was just some of the worst quarterback play you could possibly imagine, in which you go to throw and it goes straight up in the air, so you catch your own pass, and then you get hit by three people. And we still don't know the extent of his ribs injury. Well, that was, again, that is exactly what makes me so fierce about Tyrod Taylor is when he, knowing your role, you know that there's really nothing behind you. And a, and a fluky play like that, you have to have the heads up to either just bat it down or if you do happen to catch it, go to the ground and let's fight another day. I will agree with you there. I mean, catching it where he was, he was behind the line of scrimmage. He had one person behind him and two people in front of him. You know that catching it does nothing. Just bat it down. Just slam it. Just spike it right into the ground. And even if that gets you a penalty, even if – whatever, right? Who cares? Even, it, we'll move on. It, yeah. it, it, especially because he knows and we didn't know, not that we matter, but we have no idea when we're making this very opinion – we're not aware that Tommy DeVito has been splitting scout team reps and has no possible concept of the offense and is not capable of being a backup, which is an inexcusable coaching yes. decision. He knew that, though, so he has to be even more careful than he should have been in that scenario. And not for nothing, I know you think that Tyrod Taylor getting hurt, you know, I don't want to say cost us the game, but you feel as though if he were healthy the whole game we would have won. Maybe. Maybe. Because you know what? The only reason we had negative passing yardage at the end of this game is because we had negative passing yardage yeah. when he left this game. Well, he only, looked awful. My only, my only thinking with that is at least you have the notion that we might try to pass. 
<laughs> you know, so yes, with, with but... Tommy DeVito, you know, it's just stack the box and just hope for the best on each running play. But that's why I'm saying that. I mean, the odds of him throwing, pitching two shutouts in each half of not having a, a passing yard would have been just, you know, astronomical. Uh, coaching gets a fart for their yeah. game prep. And um, Tyrod Taylor gets a fart for being Tyrod Taylor in the most Tyrod Taylor way. He just also wasn't good either. He, that's I mean, what I mean. He was he was not playing. That, that touchdown was scored by Tommy DeVito. That's we, right. We got a field goal off of a sack fumble and then went three and out. That was the extent of Tyrod Taylor's points on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and we remember we even saying, like – this is a critical point in the game that we needed a touchdown right now. Yeah. Because we 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 thought that points might be a premium in this game. And I I predicted that they were the more opportunistic defense and that the team with the turnovers would win this game. The team with the turnovers would have won this game. The two the <laughs> But we didn't. My God, the fumble <laughs> in their zone and then a turnover on downs how, on their zone. How many times that this year has it been that we've had more turnovers than the other team and lost? Well, I mean, we didn't even get a turnover until like week well, three or four. We, we 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 definitely did in Buffalo. We definitely did in Miami. Now I think well, we that's did here. That's the other thing. So that's the other thing I was going to say. You, you were saying that this was like the most egregious loss that we've attended. Whatever the Buffalo one is up there for me. The Buffalo one is very close to inexcusable because you had three shots at the exact same play and you've screwed up all three. Yeah, that's incompetence. I mean, this was yeah, just like so it's... many hundred things have had to happen to us against them. I get it. Yeah. I get it. And yet oh, again, that, that's no, that's nothing I want to you know show my grandkids in 20 years. Hey, look how we've screwed this game up. But yeah. this is this is exponentially disgraceful. Well, we'll we'll save that podcast. The we'll, we'll make our pros and cons list to argue the worst game that we've watched, worst uh -huh. chance game we've watched. Um, that's a one, that's a deep this June one, game. <laughs> deep this June is a podcast. um, this one altogether was really tough for me because I hate the rain. I hate the rain more than the cold. I hate the cold more than most things. Um, this was the first cold day, and it was a rainy day, and it was coming off of an eighty-five degree day. You want to hear when you hear some bitching for a moment? If you're Junior, about to bitch that you flew up from Florida, I don't yeah, want to hear it. Junior here spent Saturday watching Florida get their asses wrung by Georgia. Junior had to get up at 5 in the morning to get on a flight. Junior had to take, let's see, Uber, train, 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 then shrug his ass from the train station to the tailgate. Nice to see everybody, uh, Justin and Snacks and company. But for all of this to watch that is just ugh, – it takes – I have more character after game weekends like this than I don't know than most of the priests and rabbis out, out there in this world. I don't know. Um, only other thing I want to talk we we talked about the offense, we talked about coaching, special given, teams. Yeah, I think we should talk and, a little bit about and, and special teams as a whole gets a fart. Um, mm -hmm. Special teams is the reason this game was lost. I, I think you, you can say a one to one. This is a sure. clear connection. Uh, a equals B. Um, specifically though, I mean, at least Graham Gano has the excuse of being hurt. It's not a good excuse and coaches should not be relying on hurt kickers to do anything, but altogether the special teams was bad. The blocking on every single Ooh. punt was bad. Hang on, hang on. You'll have, just give me five minutes here. I think Go all ahead. special teams was bad with the exception of the new guy who was returning punts. That That's was the only it. one, the only one who did his job and... I want to say he did his job well. I mean, he did his job functionally. He didn't do anything crazy. He caught the ball. He made the right decisions for fair catches. The couple great punts by the Jets punter, really, I mean, we were watching it. We were saying, like, I've never seen a ball die on turf like that. Like, mm -hmm. it's just wet, shitty weather. He made the right decision to let them go. They didn't go into the end zone because of the field. It is what it is. Otherwise, he was fine. He did what he was supposed to do. Blocking on punts was terrible. We had Jamie Gillen like running left and right before kicking <laughs> yeah. every single time. All of the punts were terrible. Yeah. He had some that were net okay, but usually on a bounce or a roll. He had one awful shank. Um, just absolutely brutal. The blocking on field goals was bad. It didn't end up as a block on that last play, but we had a guy jump over the entire offensive line. I mean, is it, is, is, is it, but is it true, though, that I think somebody said that the, their field goal when they won it was, was tipped? Their field goal? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think somebody said they heard that a lineman actually got a, a slight finger on the game-winning kick. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. yeah, yeah. 
Didn't do Which enough, been of course. Cool. What, yeah, but would have been, we said that it'd be how jetsy would this be to get this blocked yeah. or miss it? But you know. and then there was also one punt that the Jets had where Dexter Lawrence got through and very, very nearly blocked it. But in a game mm-hmm. with twenty-four punts, I am <laughs> not going to wash away any of the bad play for that. Yeah, um, I think this Giants- was a special teams nightmare. I'm going to ask you. We've we've given farts on the coaches. Their game prep was bad. I would say including not bringing in a kicker. At this point, Graham Gano has not been hurt for one week. He has not been off for one week either, right? You agree? Mm-hmm. He's yep. been he's been off for a little while. Not to even have a guy in in kicking like in in practice throughout the week and just throwing out ideas whatever. Egregious mistake, right? Mm-hmm. Um I- but you said you weren't calling for any heads. Is it time to call for Thomas McGee's head? Well, I mean, how many how many years of incompetence are we gonna have to go through? That's fair. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think also no head should be called for other than his, I think. But I think the honeymoon period of giving this coaching staff in front office a complete hall pass is over, I think. Oh I think yes. We, I think we have enough we have enough data points now. We have, you know, a se- we have a season. We have an, two off seasons and we have half of another season of decision making that not to say we're out on all of them. We want them out. But the well, they're new. Let's see what happens. We're starting to understand and starting to see trends and traits that we have to start monitoring and we have to start. Uh, you know, we're in war games. They have DEFCON 5, which is peace and DEFCON 1, which is war. I think I'm now going I, I've gone from a five to like a four, like a. I mean, just keep monitoring this stuff and see what's happening because, you know, there's some things that are starting to make me not sleep well, 100% well at night. Maybe with, you know, wake up at three in the morning, be like, huh, and go back to sleep. Your, your DEF CON ranking that has to do with the coaching staff altogether, the coaching staff in front office? Both. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm, they're not free from blame. I, we've blamed them enough already. Uh, not enough, but we blame them along the way. Uh, they've made mistakes, things we don't agree with. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you something. I might be completely off base with this one, but do you think because Dable was coach of the year last year, he has a little extra hubris about some decision making he has going forward this year, or he has nothing to do with it? You mean he is double down? doubling down on his decisions because he feels justified doubling down on them. Yeah. Like okay. a little extra confidence in what he's deciding to do and a little like, well, you know, I have, I have extra coin and extra. No. Okay. To answer your question, I'll say no. I'll say, I think he had that going into the season. Once the season started, I think he takes his job a lot more seriously. And I think based on the way oh. it started, it, he was completely out of his depth. I mean, that's out of any coach's depth. No coach is really like, ready to respond to no, let, me, let me let me nuance this a little bit then not that he wasn't taking the job seriously because hey no, i'm no, coach no. of the I, year i know, what you're, I know like, what you're asking i know what I you're have asking double i have double confidence what i'm doing because i'm coach of the year no. I, I know what you're yeah. asking yeah and i say the same thing uh, okay. Uh, okay i think that you know going into the season his decisions like i said with the roster choosing to let jay sean corbin go and keep eric gray because Oh, you know, in two years, he had this, I, I'm pretty sure, like, the two, they worked this out in, in a couple of years, maybe even next year when Barkley's gone, whatever, we'll keep him on the roster, give him reps, whatever. Total disaster of a decision. I've, I've said enough on it, I don't need to repeat it, but I think that kind of decision, pre-week one, I think that he was very confident and didn't care about outside noise. I think once the season started, I think he knew he was, this is... This is a whole other ball game now. I mean, we have to deal with big problems with Andrew Thomas being out. This offense looked completely dysfunctional. I think I think he's a smart guy. I think he's an honest guy. Uh, and I think he knew bullets were flying and that he did not have any sort of extra confidence in his stuff once okay. that – I, that, that's just how I feel. I, I don't get the sense when I listen to him talk or I look at him that he's like nodding along and be like, yeah, 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 whatever you say, buddy. Fuck you. I know what I'm doing. I, I just don't get – that's like a Bill Belichick vibe that comes off. You know what I mean? I, I don't get that vibe from him. Do you? No, I, I get it. I get a little bit of a vibe from him like what he says immediately after a game and right, maybe I'll just take a little bit of a grain of salt. I think he gets a little emotional. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to, you know, necessarily, I, I'm not a big coach speak person anyway. Yeah. Um, I, 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 my, to me, what your actions are are more important than your words. 
Um, so eh, we'll see. It's just something to kind of just keep our eye on. Um, can we end this on a little bit of a lighter note, a little brevity to make people at least not want to kill themselves? Absolutely. Let's hear it. Can I give a fart to Jet fans? Oh, I want to hear this. Okay, here, get, get your beer. Jet fans, I'm speaking to you. I'm sure there's none of you listening, but if not, I don't care. Hang on, hang on. There, there's probably one Jet fan listening that I know for sure is Dom C., who I've done a show with before. I met him at the Senior Bowl. He's a great dude. We're not talking about you, and I'm sure you know that. Go on. Yes. Jet fan, I hope you are happy that you are the cartoon character you created for yourself of what a Jet fan should be. And I know this is 30 years in the making. You know, we know the backstory of this team. You know, all the incompetence, all the woe is me stuff. But what I saw yesterday at the Meadowlands to me is an embarrassment and a disgrace to anybody who lives in the tri-state area. You clowns are so, you know, the giant, the story in this town will never be the Jets win. The story will always be the Giants lose. It's a fact. The Giants have been here for a hundred years, the Jets, you know, half that time, but they've always been the kid's sister to the Giants. And this, you know, little brother mentality, you know, it 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 was on complete display this weekend at the game. Acting like this game is your Super Bowl. When Giant fans consider the Jets to be like, well, they could be playing in Kansas City or St. Louis or Kenosha, it doesn't matter to them. There is no rivalry from the Giants standpoint, but the acting like just utter assholes during the entire game, like this game is so important. And then after the game, I was not that excited. And I was at both of those Super Bowls when we beat New, New England. I wasn't that excited as you guys were. So I just give you guys complete farts because you have no credibility to begin with. You have taken, you know, your, again, you become complete caricatures of yourselves over the time. And it was just on complete display. You are, you know, suburban white trash that acts the part and revel in it and you embarrass yourselves. So congratulations that you are the Kings of New York because you beat a third string quarterback. Congratulations that you're probably not making the playoffs anyway again. Congratulations that you are the cartoon that you are. So I give complete farts to every single one of you that were there. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, look, I, uh, I showed up late, so I didn't hit the tailgate. So I was very sober for this game. Um, so I imagine that this was uh, heavy drinking. And, and I, I actually marked the calendar as, at the beginning of the year that this would be the most fun game to go to. Uh, and that's why I hated this game so much is it, I felt cheated. You know, Daniel Jones isn't playing. Aaron Rodgers isn't playing. The, I, I the mean, rain. Everything about it was not what I wanted sure. this to be at all. This game, I, 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 even if we won this game, I'd feel like I got cheated because it was not at all what I wanted to watch. That, the vibe, the this vibe was of the, the game first was a preseason time, game. This was the first time since 2011 where you had two legitimate competitors in the – this isn't a rivalry. It's not for me anyway. But hmm. this isn't a rivalry. But this was a chance to make it one. And it, it just didn't happen by week one. So I am going to end this episode with the most deserved Luigi hat. This was Halloween costume, hence the mustache. Those of you who are still watching. Uh, Giants, you've earned this L. This was uh, very well earned. You should have won this game. It's on you. Um, I know Graham Gano knows it, so I don't need to call him out. But you know Giants how I lose. feel about you know how I feel about trusting Knowles in any situation. That's to going to do it for this episode. So we will see you guys all Friday morning for a preview episode against the Las Vegas Raiders and Sunday. And we, we, we also have a yeah, we have a big special announcement to make a major news story. Go ahead. Sunday we will be joining the Talking Giants crew to live stream the Las Vegas Raiders and the New York Giants at 425 from their studio in Manhattan. So we, you can find us all there on the Talking Giants page. I don't need to put the – you guys know where Talking Giants can be found. So check that out. We will remind you again on Friday morning. 
So be sure to subscribe to YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, etc. Tell a friends about us, the Just Giants show, at football underscore grump, at the cranky fan on Twitter, etc. Yeah, uh, this, this is exciting. This is gonna be fun. Oh God, I, I can't wait. I mean, you know, those guys, we love those guys. They've been supporters of ours from the, you know from the very beginning, and you know we're gonna have a three and a half hour conversation about, you know, what's going on. What do we think in real time? And, you know, if you have anything you want us to talk about, because this might be another ugly game, you know, let us know on Twitter, you know, uh, football underscore grump at the cranky fan, because we may need some topics. If this game is as brutal as this one was, I know I'm bringing the phone book with me. We can start reading like the, uh, the listings in the phone book because that'll kill some time, but uh, no, it'll be a lot of fun. And I, I'm really looking for, I really appreciate those guys. Uh, bringing us on and uh, it'll be good. So definitely tune in. This show is what it is and we are who we are because of them. I mean, we, yes. we, we do put in the legwork to earn what we, what we earn, but uh, we wouldn't be, we would this wouldn't be what it is without them and what they've done for us. So I'm really excited for that. And um, yeah, I can't wait to see you guys there. So please, like I said, like subscribe, etc. Tell a friend. We'll see you all Friday morning until then. Go Giants. Go Giants.